بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Dear colleagues we are now in the sector of chest imaging we have finished uh, one lecture which uh, was about the uh, way of uh, <coughs> how to interpret the chest x-rays and now uh, we are going to discuss how to look to the CT scan of the chest not how to use the CT scan in the diagnosis this is uh, the purpose of most of the coming lectures but this is just an introduction for the CT anatomy and the segmental uh, distribution of the uh, on the lung then uh, in order to uh, perform the CT scan or any radiological technique there should be some real indications for this exam then uh, these are the most common and uh, as far as I know uh, indications for the use of uh, CT scan in diagnosis of chest pathology and one of the most important uh, indications is to assess an equivocal plain x-ray finding uh, you remember from the previous lecture if you have a chest x-ray problem then you have to answer some questions and if you fail to answer these questions then you should go to the CT scan for further evaluation and verification and this is one of the rules one of the indications for CT examination of the chest then one of the important rules also is to stage the lung cancer and we'll have a full uh, lecture about uh, diagnosis and the staging of uh, lung cancer then uh, in the metastatic workup of extra thoracic malignancies a CT without contrast may be used for uh, screening the presence or absence of pulmonary metastasis diagnosis of diffuse lung disease by high resolution CT we have a full lecture about the diffuse lung disease and the role of high resolution CT in the evaluation assessment of bronchitis and uh, this is the role now of CT because the very old obsolete technique of bronchography has been uh, cancelled from the uh, uh, diagnostic tools and the, the assessment of post-traumatic complications is now one of the purposes of CT diagnosis of mediastinal and chest wall pathology and we have a full lecture about mediastinal pathology and another lecture about the chest wall lesions and uh, this is a very important indication is to assess a suspected pulmonary embolism because of the uh, very fast scanning nowadays and the uh, uh, easy evaluation of the vessels all over the body uh, through intravenous injection of contrast media may made the CT scan one of the important tools for vascular imaging nowadays then in order to do the CT scan of the chest then the patient will lie spine on the CT machine and we order the machine to have what is known as the scanogram and the scanogram is just uh, similar to the plain x-ray of the part to be examined and the value of this scanogram is to indicate the area to be scanned for the CT machine and we put a line at the, the start of the desired area and we also uh, demarcate the end of the scan and whenever you put two lines like this and the CT machine will ask you about the interval of scanning would you like to scan this area every one centimeter half centimeter three millimeter or what else then we usually scan the chest of an adult every one centimeter and the chest of a child every seven millimeter and after doing this and the machine will ask you another question would you like to inject the patient with contrast or not if you would like to do so and I will show you the indications then you inject the patient with contrast and you push the button on the keyboard which signs that you are in you are you have injected the patient with contrast in order to for this word to appear on the image then 
if you would not if you don't like to inject the patient or there is no indication to inject the patient with contrast then you say no and uh, you go uh, immediately for a scanning then uh, the machine will take a section and uh, move the bed one centimeter then take another section and so on and whenever you see the section on the keyboard or on, on the uh, screen and you you should have this appearance and this appearance for every slice what is this appearance this is known as the media style and window and there is a button on the keyboard uh, demarcated or signed as the media style and window and another uh, key uh, another button which is uh, uh, specific for the long window by mediastinal window, we mean that this is the way of uh, imaging to assess the mediastinal structures. But in this window, you cannot see the details of the lung parenchyma. While in the lung window, you can see the details of the lung parenchyma, but you cannot see the details of the mediastinal. Then you have to do both, window, both windows for every slice in the chest. Then if you have one of the recent machines, like the multi-detector machine, for example, you can order the machine to reformat or reconstruct the images into the coronal plane like this, or into the sagittal plane like this, or into the 3D fashion. Then, is every patient in need to be injected with contrast material? No. Actually, we inject contrast media to identify or to augment the appearance of the vessels in the mediastinum. Most of the mediastinum, uh, uh, most of the mediastinal structures are vascular. Then, if you want to evaluate the lung, then there may be no need to inject the patient with contrast. Like in cases of evaluation of diffuse lung disease, in evaluation of bronchiectasis, this is uh, uh, the old technique which is known as bronchography. And you inject the contrast media throughout the bronchi and have films after, of course, anesthetizing the mucosal surface of the bronchi. Then uh, screening for lung deposits, you don't need to inject the contrast. And in some cases of trauma, when vascular injury is not suspected, you may not need to inject the contrast material. Then you know that the CT machine is made of a large box known as the gantry and a bed where the patient lie, lies. Then, if you open this gantry and you will see a lot of uh, instruments and the machines, then the, uh, the most important is the X-ray tube and the imager, which is known as the detector. And the patient is in between these two important uh, parts of the machine the x-ray tube and the detector or the imager then look at uh, this is a diagram to show the position of the patient relative to the position of the x-ray tube and the detector in order to have a section in the human body then the x-ray tube should uh, rotate around the uh, the human body in a full circle and this was not feasible in the old machines because the x-ray tube is usually connected to the wall or to the ground by electricity cables then in older machines the x-ray tube has to rotate half a cycle then go back to the original site then rotate in the opposite direction and go back to the original site and uh, this means that in order to obtain a one section in the human body, the tube and the detector should rotate four times. And at that time, the CT examination of the chest was done in about one hour, 60 minutes. Then after this machine, a newer machine has been developed, which is known as the spiral CT. And by the spiral CT, we are able to provide current for the machine without cables connected to the ground. Then the machine, the tube, sorry, the, the X-ray tube is now able to rotate without stoppage. 
and meanwhile the bed is moved while the tube is rotating then you got what looks like a spiral and hence the name this is the spiral CT or volumetric CT or helical CT and this CT has greatly reduced the examination time from one hour to about 12 minutes or 10 minutes then if you have an x-ray tube and a detector single detector then every tube rotation you got a slice every tube rotation you got a slice then what happens if you put in front of the machine more than one detector let us say four four detectors in front of the x-ray tube then per tube rotation you will got four sections four sections four sections then the CT scan of the chest is now done in about three minutes or even less and this is known as multi-slice because per tube rotation you have many slices or multi-detector because you have too many detectors in front of the x-ray tube and since the invention of this machine in the late 90s uh, the number of the detectors have has been tremendously increased in front of the x-ray tube you you may know now that we have machines where there are uh, 640 detectors in front of the x-ray tube and the tube may be of course two tubes and so yeah you would we do not usually want to go into the details but this means that the machine is very fast and we have the advantage of uh, the fast scanning these are four number one you have very rapid scanning and uh, actually if you are in a busy hospital then uh, there are a lot of waiting lists and so then you can manage also vascular imaging because of the very fast scanning you can inject the contrast media intravenously and you say to, to the machine i would like to see the aorta you would like to see the coronary i'd like to see any of the vessels in the human body and the the machine is either uh, designed or you uh, put your uh, own uh, examination uh, uh, protocol and uh, there should be some uh, delay time between the injection of contrast media and the scanning in order to allow the contrast to reach the desired vessel then you have the uh, the images and you reconstruct uh, as you like as I will show you then also virtual endoscopy you can go through any uh, tube in the human body using this virtual endoscope uh, uh, built in in the CT scan and uh, of course the reconstruction uh, of the images in the vertical planes like the coronal the sagittal the oblique and all the planes can be easily done immediately and these are some of the examples here i show you i show to you one of the examples you, uh, of the ct pulmonary angiography using the multi detector uh, ct scan we inject the contrast intravenously and we calculate the delay time between the injection of contrast and the arrival of the contrast media into the pulmonary vessels then we start the scanning and we obtain uh, the reconstructed images or the axial images whatever you like then you have the ability to display images also in color then uh, look at this very small distant pulmonary embolus which is in a very uh, small branch near the diaphragm and uh, it can be identified by this technique meanwhile this embolus can never be detected by either the ventilation perfusion scan or the selective pulmonary angiogram also here you can uh, you have the ability to subtract from the image any of the uh, anatomic or pathologic structures as you can see here we have uh, removed the chest wall the ribs the spine and the lung fields as well 
we are left with the pulmonary uh, vessels and we can rotate the image to see uh, every branch in uh, not overlapped with other branches also you can assess the coronary vessels like this one and uh, this is an image of the uh, coronary circulation obtained by CT scan with 3D reconstruction and uh, uh, color imaging. Then you can remove the cardiac muscle in order to see clearly the coronary vessels as well. And also if you want to show the full course of any of the branches, you may order the machine to do this technique and this is known as curved reconstruction. And you can see the coronary vessel from in the start uh, at the coronary sinus until its uh, final destination. Also, you can easily evaluate the lower limb vessels, including the abdominal aorta, the iliac arteries, and the femoral vessels. You see, this uh, is almost intact, and here you can see occlusion of the femoral artery. And you can display also the renal uh, vessels in color 3D, 2D, uh, whatever you like and very importantly in the casualty and the emergency room and instead of doing direct femoral angiography as, been, as has been performed previously we may inject the contrast intravenously and to show the circulation of both lower limbs in few seconds and this is an example of 3D reconstructed image of the thigh showing this is the common femoral artery and this is the, uh, the deep femoral which is intact and the superficial femoral is occluded from here up to this level also you can uh, see the mesenteric circulation and uh, you can subtract the intestine or uh, leave it as in this image and then you can rotate also the image to see any of the uh, important uh, branches. Then we came to the uh, anatomy of the chest and we have two images as you remember the mediastinal images and the lung images. In the mediastinal images we will identify the mediastinal structures. In the lung images we will identify the lobes and the segments of uh, each lobe. Then in order to uh, interpret the CT scans of the chest and you have to identify our anatomic landmark which is the arch of the aorta. And uh, the arch of the aorta is known by most of the chest physicians in my country as the banana. And they think it is almost similar to the banana. Then starting interpretation of the chest, you should put your finger on the banana and this is the arch of the aorta. And if you look here, what is beside the arch of the aorta, and you see the superior vena cava. And here is the superior vena cava and nothing more. This is mediastinal fat and this is the trochea and this is the collapsed esophagus and you don't see any more anatomic details. The arch of the aorta and the superior vena cava. Then, what happens if you go above the arch of the aorta? This is the arch of the aorta and this is the superior vena cava. Then if you have a section a little bit above the arch of the aorta, then you will see the branches coming out from the arch of the aorta, which are the left subclavian, left common carotid, and the innominate artery. And you can see the alignment of the vessels is exactly similar to the arch of the aorta then at that time you will see these two important veins which are the brachiocephalic or the innominate vein on the left side crossing the midline to join the right one to form the superior vena cava lower down then this is the uh, left brachiocephalic vein and this is the right one they will join together to form the superior vena cava in the lower section then if you go more up the anatomy is the same this is the branches coming out from the arch of the aorta this is the left subclavian left common carotid the nominate artery and this is the left innominate vein and the right innominate vein or the brachiocephalic vein lower down the left one will cross the midline to join the right one lower down they will join to form the superior vena cava then if you go below the arch of the aorta, you will meet the pulmonary artery. Let us see. 
and here is a section in the arch of the aorta and you can see the arch of the aorta and the superior vena lower down the arch of the aorta will divide into ascending and descending then this is the ascending aorta and this is the descending aorta and this is the superior vena cava lower down the arch of the aorta is separated into the ascending and descending aorta and there is a space and this space is for the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary artery is like the inverted V and you can see this is the main trunk and this is the left main branch and this is the right main branch this is the ascending aorta and the superior vena cava and this is the descending aorta then once more this is the ascending aorta and this is the descending aorta they have divided and the pulmonary artery will appear here in this particular area and this is the superior vena cave lower down you will see the pulmonary artery like the inverted v and you see here this is the main trunk left branch right branch and this is the, the ascending aorta the superior vena cava and the descending aorta then once more this is the anatomy here is the pulmonary artery main trunk left branch right branch ascending aorta superior vena cava and descending aorta lower down we are going to see if one every one of these vessels will enter a specific cardiac chamber except the descending aorta will descend into the abdomen then the superior vena cava will enter the right atrium the ascending aorta will enter the left ventricle the pulmonary artery will enter the right ventricle then this is the superior vena cava and this is the superior vena cava and here is the beginning of the right atrium and this is the superior vena cava and this is the right atrium and this is the superior vena cava that has entered the right atrium then this is the pulmonary artery and uh, this is the pulmonary artery it will enter the right ventricle it has entered the right ventricle and this is the right ventricle and this is the right atrium then this is the ascending aorta and this is the ascending aorta and this is the ascending aorta and this is the ascending aorta it will enter here and this is the left ventricle and the left ventricle is adjacent to the right and the right is adjacent to the atrium then the final chamber or the uh, remaining chamber will be the left atrium this is the left atrium left ventricle right ventricle and right atrium and this is of course the aortic root then if you look carefully here and you can see this is the right atrium this is the left atrium and this is the aortic root this is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle lower down and this is the left atrium right atrium right ventricle left ventricle lower down this is the left atrium right atrium right ventricle left ventricle and this is the entrance of the inferior vena cava into the right atrium and here you can see the dome of the diaphragm and the uh, liver then we used to uh, continue scanning the chest until we can see the suprarenal glands because you know in cases of bronchogenic carcinoma uh, a common site of metastasis is the suprarenal glands and you may say that uh, not every uh, patient had a bronchogenic carcinoma but uh, actually we have a problem to 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 uh, monitor the cases uh, on the while they are examined by a specialist and uh, we usually depend on the technician and so we give him an instruction and instructions to continue the scan until he can see the suprarenal gland and the suprarenal gland is like an inverted Y above the upper bowl of the kidney and this is the right suprarenal gland and this is the left one and this is an example of bilateral metastatic deposits in the suprarenal glands from a case of bronchogenic carcinoma then we should uh, know some of the anatomic details about the mediastinal lymph nodes and first of all you should know that mediastinal lymph nodes are not seen in the scan if they are normal and then the nodes which are seen in the scan are pathologically enlarged then we have nine groups of mediastinal lymph nodes and these groups start by the retrosternal group or the internal mammary group which are located posterior to the sternum to the left and to the right of the midline then the retrocaval group of lymph nodes are located posterior to the superior vena cava 
you can call them also paratracheal, right? Paratracheal lymph nodes. This is the trachea and this is the esophagus. Then you came to the prevascular lymph nodes, which are located along the arch of the aorta. These are the prevascular lymph nodes, and this is the retrochaval lymph node. Then you came to the fourth group, which is the aortic window, and this, this is the group of lymph nodes which appear between the ascending and the descending aorta above the pulmonary artery, and this is what we call the pre or the aortic window lymph nodes. Then the carina lymph nodes are arranged around the tracheal bifurcation. Anteriorly located nodes are known as precarinal. If there are nodes behind, we call them retrocarinal. And the group of lymph nodes present between the tracheal bifurcation or between the menstem bronchi, you call it subcarinal lymph nodes. Then the group of lymph nodes at the hilum are known as the hilar group of lymph nodes. And the nodes related to the esophagus and the azygos vein are known as digoesophageal group of lymph nodes, or you call it posterior mediastinal group of lymph nodes. This is okay. And the final group is the circumcardiac. And the circumcardiac lymph nodes are uh, usually appear in the skin as a sheet of uh, soft tissue masses surrounding the heart, especially along its anterior aspect. And uh, frequently you can see associated pericardial effusion and most of the books say that circumcardiac lymph nodes are almost pathognomonic for non hodgkin lymphoma and if you see this car this circumcardiac lymph nodes you may suspect that the patient had uh, non hodgkin lymphoma then uh, this clinical note is very important and uh, if you see here this is a scan and you see the arch of the aorta and the superior vena cava and you see a slightly enlarged lymph node posterior to the superior vena cava, what we call the retrocaval lymph node. And uh, we usually advise our uh, candidates not to consider this lymph node as pathological unless you have a clinical, uh, a clinical uh, evidence of a disease. Like, if the patient is known to have a primary malignancy, you consider it. If the patient is known to have lymphoma, you consider it. If the patient is known to have sarcoid, you consider it. But if this is a patient on routine uh, chest uh, 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 CT or a checkup examination or is not complaining of anything, then you can, you can ignore this because this lymph node is the only one which can be allowed to appear like this and is considered within normal. Then uh, lymphadenopathy is a common abnormality. It occurs in all mediastinal compartments. We'll see this in the mediastinal uh, imaging lecture. And nodes are usually seen, are not usually seen on imaging if they are normal. And enlarged lymph nodes may be, there, are, there is a very big list, we'll discuss it once more, but uh, these are the common uh, lymph node pathologies you can meet in the clinical practice, either due to lymphoma or leukemia or metastatic uh, from primary malignancies, infection like TB and sarcoid, and the lymphoid hyperplasia. Then uh, the few words about the virtual endoscopy, which is one of the uh, facilities provided by multi-detector CT. And you want to go through the trachea and the main stem bronchi using the virtual endoscope. All what you need is to get to the patient and you scan the chest every one uh, centimeter as we have mentioned and then you order the machine to subtract all the structures leaving only the trachea and the bronchi and you put them in a 3D fashion like this then you push the button on the machine which is uh, concerned with this virtual endoscope and uh, at that time uh, the virtual endoscope will open then you put the your cursor or your pointer at the start of the trachea and start the scanning through the trachea as you can see here then you, you can see this is the beginning of the trachea and you are going through the trachea and you see the carina like this and then you select one of the main bronchi like the right one and you go deep all through scanning this uh, bronchus then you go back 
and you start scanning the uh, left uh, main bronchus as well as its uh, eight branches and this is an easy and uh, uh, technique and it is, 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 is used mainly for screening and for the diagnosis of uh, inhaled foreign bodies in the pediatric age group as well as in some cases of bronchogenic carcinoma in others then uh, 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 after this we uh, will continue with the uh, lung anatomy and as i have said we will uh, 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 we will describe first the uh, lower anatomy then we'll discuss the segmental anatomy Actually, you, you know that on the right side, we have two fissures, the major one and the, the, uh, the horizontal fissure or the transverse fissure. On the left side, we have the major fissure and we can imagine a fissure at this dot line in order to separate the lingula from the rest of the upper loop. Actually, you know that the lingula is a part of the upper, uh, of the upper loop, as you all know. Then, our anatomic landmark is the trachea. And if you see the trachea, you are cutting in the upper loop. Then this is the left upper loop, and this is the right upper loop. And if anywhere you see the trachea, you are cutting in the upper loop. This is the trachea, then this is the left upper loop, and this is the right upper loop. Then what happens if the trachea has divided into two main stem bronchi? At this level, you are near the hilum, exactly here. Then, if you look to the section on the left, you will see part of the upper loop and part of the lower loop. On the right side, you will see part of the upper loop and part of the lower loop. Then, if you go to the CT section and you see anteriorly, you can see the upper loop on the left side. And posteriorly, you can see the lower loop on the left side. This upper loop, lower loop. Okay. Here you see the tracheal bifurcation. Then, whenever the trachea divides, the section is divided by two. Then you got anteriorly the upper loop, posteriorly the lower loop. Okay. Then if you go lower down, you are cutting in the cardiac shadow here. On the left side, you see the lingula anteriorly and the rest of the lower loop posteriorly. On the right side, you see the middle loop and the rest of the lower loop posteriorly. Then if you consider the size of the lingula through the thoracic diameter, it will represent one third and also the middle loop. Then you draw a line dividing the thoracic uh, cavity into anterior one third and posterior two thirds. The anterior one third on the left side is the lingula, on the right side is the middle loop. The posterior two thirds on the right and on the left represent the middle, the, the lower loops. Then. If you look to this CT scan and you see a mnemonic consolidation with air bronchogram and you want to specify the site of this lesion, then look at the trachea. Here you are at the site of the tracheal bifurcation, then this is the left upper loop and this is the left lower loop. Okay, then here you see some bronchiectatic changes and the trachea has been divided, then anteriorly is the upper loop, posteriorly is the lower loop, and this is the right lower loop bronchiectasis. And here you see a mnemonic batch, and uh, now you are cutting at the level of the heart. Then the anterior third will belong to the lingula on the left, and to the middle loop on the right, and this is lingula on the left side. Now we came to the segmental anatomy. And in the segmental anatomy, you, you know that the upper lobe is uh, divided on the left side, on the right side, into three segments anterior segment, apical segment, and the posterior segment. While on the left side, the, the apical and the posterior segments, the apical and posterior segments usually fuse together to form the apical posterior segment. Then on the right side, you have three segments. On the left side, you have only two segments. Let's look to the CT scan. We can draw lines like this, two lines. This line demarcates the region of the anterior segment. Then on the right side, this is the anterior segment, and this is the posterior segment, 
and this is the apical segment which is in the middle between the anterior and the posterior but on the left side the apical and the posterior unite and then you have an anterior segment and an apical posterior segment very good then look here this is the trachea and then you are cutting in the upper loop if you say these nodules are present in the upper loop it's okay but if you want to specify the segment and this is the anterior segment of the left upper loop and here you can see a mass this is the upper loop because the trachea this is the upper loop and this lesion would be in the apical and and in the anterior partly and the apical posterior segment of the upper loop okay then you came to the trachea bifurcation and whenever the trachea bifurcates then you get division of the section into two like this if you look here on the left side this section is near to the hilum. what is remaining from the upper lobe it is the anterior segment and the superior segment of the lower lobe and here the anterior segment of the upper lobe because the apical and the posterior are not yet present and you see the superior segment of the lower lobe then look at the tracheal bifurcation on the left is exactly similar to the right anteriorly you will see the anterior segment of the upper lobe here this is the anterior segment of the upper lobe and posteriorly you will see the apical segment of the lower lobe and this is the apical segment of the lower lobe then if you look here and you want to specify this lesion and you say this is the right lower lobe why the trachea is bifurcated this is the upper lobe and this is the lower lobe but which part of the lower lobe it is the superior segment of the lower lobe where this proportional carcinoma is present that if you look to these metastases and you want to locate the site of the biggest one or the uh, this lesion in particular and you see the tracheal bifurcation and this is the upper lobe and this is the lower lobe then if you say this is lower lobe good if you say this is the superior segment of the left lower lobe good and of course this will be in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe and this lesion will be in the in the superior segment of the right lower lobe okay then you came to the level of the heart and you remember we draw a line like this separating the section into anterior third and posterior two thirds the anterior third on the left is the lingula the anterior third on the right is the middle loop then what are the segments of the lower loop you remember the superior segment we have finished it then the basal segments anterior posterior median and lateral on the right side on the left side anterior posterior lateral only there is no median segment on the left side then if you draw lines like this remember that you are here in the lower loop you are here on the lower loop then this area will be the anterior segment and this area will be the posterior segment and on the left side this is the lateral segment but on the right side there should be medial and lateral and this is the medial segment this very small segment which is not seen on the left side represents the medial segment of the lower lobe then you have anterior posterior medial and lateral on the right side anterior posterior lateral only on the left side then let's make a test and this is a, a section through the cardiac shadow this is the lingula and this is the middle loop and you remember this is anterior this is posterior this is medial and this is lateral on the right side then what about the lingular segments and the middle loop segment? On the, on the middle loop has two segments, the medial one and the lateral one. The medial is closer to the heart and the lateral is away from the heart. Then the lingula has two also segments, which are the superior one, which is away from the heart, and the inferior one, which is closer to the heart. Then look at this CT scan of the chest high resolution scan and you can see the site of the fissure 
which is almost corresponding to the line I draw through the thoracic cavity. Dividing the thorax into anterior one-third and posterior two-thirds. Then if I asked you about this area, you will say that this is the medial segment of the middle lobe. And this area, this is the anterior segment of the left lower lobe. And this area is the superior segment of the lingula. And this area is the medial segment of the lower lobe on the right side. And this is the posterior segment of the right lower lobe. And this is the anterior segment of the right lower lobe. And this is the lateral segment of the right lower loop. Then this is a case of cancer breast performed with radical mastectomy and received the radiation and she developed post radiation scarring. Which part of the lung? Look at the tracheal bifurcation. This, the trachea has divided then the section is divided. This is the upper loop and this is the lower loop. If you want to specify which part of the upper loop and this is the anterior segment. Then this is irradiation pneumonitis in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe. Okay, this patient has metastatic colorectal cancer and multiple pulmonary metastatic deposits are seen. What do you think of these metastatic deposits? This one is in the anterior segment of the left lower lobe and this one is in the medial segment of the right lower lobe and this one is in the lateral segment of the right lower lobe. This is the bronchogenic carcinoma, and you see the trachea has not yet divided. Then you are cutting in the upper loop. This is the right upper loop. Okay, which segment? This is the anterior, and this is the posterior, and the tumor is located in the apical segment of the right upper loop. Very good. And this is the bronchogenic carcinoma. You look to the tracheal bifurcation and the, the trachea has divided, the section is divided. This is the anterior segment and this is the, the superior segment of the left lower loop. And this is carcinoma in the superior segment of the left lower loop. And this is the patchy area of pneumonitis. And uh, if you look to this section, you can draw a line. One third anterior, two third posteriorly. And the patch is in the superior segment of the lingula. Then what do you think of this pulmonary nodule? It is in the upper loop. Which upper loop? The left one. Which segment? The anterior segment. Yes, very good. Because if you draw a line here and you see this is the anterior segment, apical and posterior, you fuse together. And this patient had TB of the lung. Then if you look to this pulmonary nodule, consider the tracheal bifurcation, then this is the anterior segment of the, of the left upper loop. Then you got uh, some infiltrations here. Consider the cardiac shadow, and this is the lingula. Then you got an abscess in this area. Consider the cardiac shadow, and this is the posterior segment of the left lower loop. And you got another abscess here. And consider the tracheal bifurcation, and this is upper loop, this is lower loop, and this is the superior segment of the right lower loop. These are metastatic deposits. What do you think of this? Look at the tracheal bifurcation. This is the anterior segment of the left upper lobe. What do you think of this? And this is the a superior segment of the right lower lobe. And this is also in the superior segment of the left lower lobe. And this is in the anterior segment of the left upper lobe. You consider the tracheal bifurcation. This is the anterior segment of the right upper loop. Then you remember this patient with pulmonary embolism and multiple infarctions. This is the embolus in the, right, in the left main pulmonary artery and these are the three infarctions. The first one is in the inferior segment of the lingula. The second one is in the superior segment of the lingula and the third one is located in the posterior segment of the left lower loop. Then you see this patient with uh, bronchiectasis and cavity. And you see the fissure, the site of the fissure, which corresponds to the line I draw here. Consider the tracheal bifurcation. Then this is the anterior segment 
of the left upper lobe then the cavity will be in the apical or the superior segment of the left lower lobe also you see these bronchiectatic changes they are located in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe very good then this patient with thyroid carcinoma has metastatic deposit in the medial segment of the right lower lobe. Okay, I hope you remember the mediastinal anatomy and we will revise it uh, quickly. And you see it, this is the brachiocephalic vein on the left side crossing the midline to join the right one. And of course, this will be the left subclavian artery and this is the left common carotid artery and this is the esophagus. Then if you look here, this is the pulmonary main trunk and this is the ascending aorta and this is the superior vena cava and this is the descending aorta. Then uh, this is of course the arch of the aorta or the banana and uh, this is the right main pulmonary artery and this is the descending aorta and here you can see the superior vena cava. Then the remaining branch is the main pulmonary trunk. Okay, if you look to this cardiac chambers, and this is the right atrium, and this is the left atrium, and this is the right ventricle, and this is the left ventricle, and this is the descending aorta. Then this patient had pneumonic consolidation. Considering the tracheal bifurcation, part of the pneumonia is located in the upper lobe, and part is located in the lower lobe. Then this pneumonic consolidation has affected the anterior segment of the upper lobe as well as the superior segment of the lower lobe on the right side. Then considering the tracheal bifurcation and on the side of the fissure, this dot will be in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe and this one will be in the superior segment of the left lower lobe. And this will be in the anterior segment of the left upper lobe. Then once more the mediastinal anatomy, this is the descending aorta, and this is the pulmonary main trunk, and this is the superior vena cava. And here you can see a bronchogenic carcinoma with classic speculated margin. And if you want to locate this bronchogenic carcinoma, you do these lines. And this is the line which separates the middle lobe from the lower lobe. And here this is the anterior segment and this is part of the lateral segment and this is the posterior segment and here you can see the, the, the medial segment then this bronchogenic carcinoma is lying between the lateral and the posterior segments of the right lower lung lobe and i thank you very much